<laughs> you're, you're about to be killed by a Zamboni! Welcome back. Today we've got more movement drills, we've got more puck drills, and we've got a super inspirational story about Corbin Watson, my Deadpool goalie. You won't believe the stuff he went through and the stuff he overcame to get to the highest levels of hockey as a goaltender. Let's get started. This movement drill requires all the same attributes I demand from my athletes. Violent pushes, violent knee drives, and explosive transitions. Step off the post hard to the middle angle. Execute a perfect square stop and then drive the knees aggressively. Execute a hard pivot, push hard, and then mid-slide plant, pivot, and transition in the opposite direction. There are a million variations you can do off this drill, so be creative and come up with your own variations off this standard transition drill. All right, here's today's puck drill. Last video we talked about looking off the puck and managing backdoor threats. Here is the actual drill breakdown for this approach and how you can improve in this area. Always use a shooter you can trust and start with a planted man on his good side, meaning off wing so he can cork one tees. For high and mid zone guys, try to get there on your feet, targeting the top of the crease. On tight, low angle backdoor passes, slide back to the post in an RVH or slight overlap. There's a million drill variations you can do off of this setup as well. Number one, add extra men at various depths, requiring the goalie to read the pass, read the pass angle, and to determine who is getting it and the depth to use. A second variation is allow the man to migrate around, so you have to continually adjust your off-puck assessment. Working on attacks off the puck are a common thing that happens in the game and something that you should commonly work and practice to address, so in games, they're simple. Deadpool. So it was always one of my favorite comics, but I think it more relates to me because no matter what happens to him, he always heals, but he always has the scars from it. That's sweet, the so Deadpool. Canadian guy. Yep. Superhero landing! All the dinosaurs feared the T-Rex. Show me your trapper and talk to me about some of the mods that you have on that. So the biggest mod that we have is mostly on the back of the glove for our picks. So right. for us to move, we need to have it a little bit in case we do lose the stick. Then at least we can push around and move. That helps us get around at least. Mine, it's a little bit different because we Velcro it down a lot better than before where guys had to stitch it or actually screw through the material. Now what about the stick? And then the stick we have, where it's a lot smaller than your normal stand-up stick. Right. Because we're a lot shorter. But picks on the back help us move forward, sometimes backwards, but that's the go. And then we have, for our scolies, we get a special one where it's a crown pick. So that help us, helps us push in different directions, also helps us reverse and everything else. So it's a lot of changing speed, changing how you're going to use both 
picks in tandem so you can try keeping your glove up. And when you need to, glove goes down, then you try using it. Yeah. Because it's... Yeah, throw that back up again one more time. Oh, here, I'll do it this way. It's easier you're going to be getting out. So it's strapped to you? Yep. We right around your hips. In, so we have to stay in so we can't fall out of it. But biggest thing is, leg goes here or however you go. Mine's so short because a lot of goalies are playing cross-legged. Right. A couple goalies still play long. But the biggest thing is, we have the blades on the back. Players are really close together so they can be agile. We want a little bit further apart so we can actually have our stability plus our agility in that. A lot of guys, I still use steel. A lot of guys are using Teflon to push themselves side to side a lot easier so they don't get the friction of the ice. I still like to have a little bit of edge so I can move out, play, and be on ice. Stop and stop and find and your target. So I can actually be ready. Right. Be ready for the puck. Use your powers for good. Heads up. So what was your first contact with Future Pro and where did you first cross my path, unfortunately? <laughs> oh, I think my first time. Oh, was it? it was a, I think it was an Adam, I think, where I first crossed paths with you. And it was in Tecumseh, Ontario, when my first camp was. I remember it because I think after the second day, I think my legs were hurting so much trying to move that it was, I'm like, do I have to go? Yes, yes, it's good for you. Okay, fine. Nice. Wait, and it was a great week. I always had fun coming back. And I think that's when I got hooked into coming to Future Pro because I think I came, I think once or twice a year after that. Excellent. So you also stayed at the Future Pro Complex. My wife did the cooking. We housed 30 people there. And what was it like staying at the Future Pro Complex? And was there any notable other students attending the camps in the week before? Yeah, I always remember Eddie. He was always a notable guy when you were helping with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And he, when he came down, it was a fantastic experience, especially when I was able to play some pool with him for a while. I know through the week, it was an interesting week because the power outages and everything that went on that year it was a crazy year but he always enjoyed going down shooting some pool with us and i remember doing that with him a couple times through the week he went on to play uh, junior hockey trying out around different places and and then he ended up having a, a a tragic accident and could you just talk to us a little bit about um what you were doing with your career before that happened and in the hospital afterwards thinking you know is hockey done for me yeah uh I know leading up to the accident and everything, I was just trying to figure out where I was going because I had a couple of junior tryouts, got a couple of exhibition games in and everything. It just never panned out. I remember one guy saying, if we didn't already sign a guy from the States, you'd be here and be playing. So to hear some of those instances where it was just so close to making some of the teams I was really thinking about, is this the way I wanted to go or do I, should I start going to school? Because it's getting to that point in life where it's one or the other and it's tough to constantly do both unless you really get picked up. But I know I went to college for a little bit up in Sudbury and when I came back down, I was living around home and I was coming back home from somewhere and it was on a really bad rainy night. Uh, probably should not have been on the road. Came over a culvert and when I landed on the ground, it, the car lost its control in a hydroplane and I went to the right which was better than the left. The left had a huge ditch, so that was probably the better of the choices, but it barrel rolled a couple times and smashed into a tree. The whole front end, and it was a Pontiac Sunfire, so it wasn't the biggest of cars, but the whole front end and the steering wheel and dashboard, it went smashed off and ripped off and about 100 feet into the field, and the rest of the car was up against the tree with me in it. Uh, I was lucky enough that the seat broke backwards to save me from being crushed by the top of the roof. Also having jeans on naturally made a natural tourniquet around my leg. When a uh, stranger came, they just went on a whim to go down this road and the woman saw that there was taillights in the field. So they stopped by and they checked and they're like, you've been in a car accident. Me, with how in shock I was, I didn't feel any pain, didn't even know I was in a car accident. It was quite a surprise to me at that time. So the firefighters got there. I heard the sounds of them using the jaws of life, which was a really interesting experience, especially when you go, oh, you almost got them. That's a really crazy thing to hear when they're trying to get you out. But the biggest thing that I always take away from it is when the paramedics showed up, they asked the firefighters where was the body. That's when I knew how bad the accident was. So when I went to the hospital, this happened on a Thursday. I got put into a medically induced coma till Sunday. 
And then after that, I still had my leg. They were trying to save it for the longest time. Uh, I broke my collarbone from the seatbelt, broke my left arm, smashing into the door. I fractured my left knee, and then I severely broke my right leg, and then had a punctured lung in my right lung. I kept my leg for, from November till just before February. That's when things weren't going right after nine surgeries, leg kept blocking off, the arteries they kept putting in just didn't hold. So they're like, okay, we have two choices. It's either you have surgery and we'll wrap the muscle around your leg and fuse your ankle, or we can amputate and take your leg. Well, 19, 20, that's a really big question to ask. So it took me a couple, a couple little bit of time Talked to a couple different amputees. One, he actually plays stand-up hockey. So it was really cool to meet him and, and talk to him. And then another one was uh, actually one of the, vision, or the uh, x-ray technicians there. He uh, still knows his last name, Dell. He plays wheelchair basketball and he was an above knee amputee. I talked to him and he gave me so much good advice and says, no matter what, if you lose your leg, your life isn't over, there's so many different options you can go. So in the end, I chose to amputate my leg. So after the amputation, everything went. Oh yeah, um, I'm, I'm grateful for everything that they, they were around. They were there for me every step of the way. Literally almost every step of the way because trying to figure out how to walk again, I know they were there. I didn't have a natural prosthetic leg for a year afterwards because of so much complications with my stump that I had. So to be, to see the commitment that they had towards me, I use it in my own to help, to help my kids and help be there for them no matter what, even though they, kids. <laughs> yeah. So you go from the absolute low point in your life, arguably, to now, let's fast forward to your greatest accomplishment as a, as a sledge player, what would be your greatest accomplishment when you transition down to the ice? Uh, I think pretty much one of the greatest accomplishments for me was the world championships I won. It was a crazy experience. I know, well, there's so many experiences. It's hard to pick from. Like I could say when I first made the team to represent our country, which was fantastic. It, I didn't even think I had a chance. I have to say one of the best because I never let any in. I had zero goals against. Uh, my partner, he supported me throughout. He only got to play one game in that tournament, but he pushed me going saying, you have it no matter what happens, you keep pushing through. And we beat the States in a one nothing game in the finals. And I remember that as one of my greatest achievements and greatest accomplishments to this time. And I know I want it to be, but I also want to push for more. Well, I think we'll wrap this up by saying, I've been coaching goalies for 30 years. And I remember you when you were a kid, I remember you staying at the house and People ask me all the time, like, who are some of the goalies you coached? And they want me to talk about Ed Belfour, NHL guys, and people that have done this, people have done that. But I always tell people, I'm more proud of the students that have been through the camps that I've been involved with that have become doctors, lawyers, teachers, people that fight in the military, and people that overcome crazy, difficult life challenges. They don't bend in. And I think if there's a model to the future for a way, it's something that you've lived and breathed. You just didn't give in, and you could have went down that path quite easily of woe's me, the world sucks. You've done something very uplifting, and I'm as proud of what you've accomplished as what somebody like Eddie Belfour has done or, or one of my other kids that started with us that went to the NHL. So you gotta be very proud of yourself. You got a great role model as a person to look up to. Your kids look up to you, and I think everybody that watches this video is gonna look up to you. So thanks for taking the time to come out today, Corbin and let me score a couple goals on you. <laughs> and I think I'll edit out all the saves. <laughs> but great job and great to see you again, Corbin. Oh, thank you for having me here. Once you asked me to do this, I jumped on it right away. It was, I couldn't wait. It was so excited for it. Dig your picks in. Holy crap, you're flying. <laughs> That's you all the way out. Jeez.